Hello and welcome to this episode of Climate Crisis Thinking, hosted by the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities, one of a series of podcasts created for the COP26 Innovation Showcase programme. I'm Stephen Smith. I'm researching climate change politics at the Centre for Environment and Sustainability at the University of Surrey. To innovate is to bring in something new. So what innovations do we need to address the climate crisis? Well, most of us automatically think of engineered technologies like solar panels, wind turbines and electric vehicles. Our elected leaders also like to focus on technology. They, they tell us that as long as we switch to renewable technologies by 2050, we'll be fine. And we don't even have to give up anything to get there. Being green is easy, we're told. It's just a question of technology, finance, markets and new sources of energy. But when I first started working on climate change in 1991, the scientific consensus then was that we needed urgently to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 60%. Instead, over those 30 years, we've actually increased them by 60%. And the consequences of that collective failure are everywhere. Devastating wildfires, floods, droughts, crop failures, refugees, conflicts, extinctions. These consequences are going to get worse until we stop emitting these gases into our atmosphere. If we don't do it fast enough, it's also possible that we could cross one or more tipping points that accelerate climate overheating, with consequences that would be catastrophic to everyone and everywhere that we care about. The innovations we need now go far beyond technology. The purpose of the Climate Crisis Thinking podcast is to invite you to think about other kinds of innovations, including innovations in education, in the future of work, in more democratic institutions, in the arts, in social practices and behavioural changes, in activism, campaigning, and the narratives that can mobilise and bring together a critical mass for, for change. And innovations to help us think about what really matters and what we value. In this podcast, we'll discuss a few innovations in politics and society at the global and local scales. And I've invited some experts at the forefront of thinking in this area to explain the kinds of innovations they think would really make a difference in accelerating the transition to a safe climate future. First up, I spoke to Alex Evans, the founder and executive director of Larger Us and author of The Myth Gap, what happens when evidence and arguments aren't enough? And I began by asking Alex, what's wrong with this dominant technology-based being green is easy narrative? Well, I guess what's wrong with that narrative is that it misses out that people are complicated and don't always act as kind of rational economic actors. I mean, the obvious example of that is stuff like domestic energy efficiency, which if you tot up the costs, it's cheaper than free. It'll save you money. And yet, we've made much less progress over the last decade and longer than we need to on that, because in the real world, doing domestic efficiency, stuff like lagging your loft or replacing your boiler, it involves upfront costs, which take a long time to recoup. It's not straightforward if you're renting your property rather than you own it. There's a lot of hassle involved. And these in the real world are factors that weigh on people. But obviously the, the bigger picture is that climate isn't just about technology or investment. Um, I've always seen it first and foremost as a collective action problem. I mean, it's full of examples of I will if you will. And we see that at the kind of international level where obviously no country wants to move radically on this unless it's confident that other countries are going to be coming in too. And in a smaller way, you know, that's probably true for lots of us at individual level as well. But I think that, you know, thinking of it as a collective action problem, the thing I've really become most interested in in recent years is what opens up or closes down the political space for radical change, because this isn't just collective action in the sense of like what happens at United Nations summit. It's also about you know, our voters demanding this from governments. Do governments feel that they've got not just a mandate, but a clear demand from citizens to make this happen because I think a lot of the time what we see is governments running quite shy of really uh, going full steam ahead on this transaction sorry transformation yes I'm completely with you there Alex I don't think governments are going to act fast enough until people collectively demand it 
The aim of your organisation, Larger Us, is to imagine and co-create new forms of leadership and citizenship at the places where states of mind and the state of the world intersect. Could you talk us a bit through that sentence and explain why we need that kind of innovation and how you're trying to make it happen? So at the heart of our work, there are basically two ideas. The first is that we need to become a larger us. Um, and that, I suppose, has two sort of sub meanings within it. The first is that we need to, if you like, what Einstein called expand our circles of compassion so that the us that we identify with is not just our immediate social networks or the town where we live, but ultimately includes all of humanity and indeed other species and future generations of both come to that. Um, so, you know, and that's necessary because this is a global problem, which obviously has very unequal global impacts. All of us are already being affected by climate change. Um, but the people most at the sharp end are people who are very often on the other side of the world, least responsible for causing it. And it's essential that we see them as part of, you know, what we think of as us in inverted commas. The other half of being a larger us is overcoming the kind of them and us, the political polarization that we keep seeing in so many contexts, especially in the United States, of course, where opinion polling shows that climate is even more polarized than abortion as a political issue with disastrous consequences for actually doing anything about the issue. Instead, you get these constant log jams on Capitol Hill and in states uh, and so on. But, you know, there's a risk of climate becoming a new culture war, if you like, uh, in other countries, too. I think there's lots of examples of ways that, um, you know, kind of climate skeptics are trying to polarize climate. Um, so that's another way in which we need to, in which we need to become a larger us. The second big idea that we're really interested in is that in order to become that larger us, this is as much about psychology as it's about politics. It's as much about, you know, states of mind as state of world. And I guess I first started thinking about that when I was working on Brexit as a campaign director at Avaaz and became very uneasy that what I was doing in this very Remain leaning campaign was kind of contributing to this wound of political polarization rather than helping to heal it. Um, and that took me into a sort of deep interest in the psychology of how polarization happens. And for example, how when we feel threatened, when we go into a kind of fight or flight state, we immediately become less empathetic, more concerned with our individual self-interest, less interested in the interests of the collective. Um, we become less good at telling the difference between what's real and what's illusory or hypothetical. A very big deal when conspiracy theories are as important as they are and fake news too. So for all of these reasons, it felt like future uh, campaigning and policy making about climate and lots of other issues too, was gonna need to be a lot smarter about psychology um, and kind of using psychology in ways that bring us together rather than dividing us against each other. OK, so the environmental movement needs to be smarter about how it casts that widest possible net to draw people together. And you've also said that to achieve anything radical requires both bold policies and election wins. And isn't there a dilemma there? Because in order to win elections, you have to appeal to the majority. But the majority, at least right now, are pragmatists, not radicals, because they don't yet perceive the climate crisis as a real emergency, demanding a radical response. So how do you resolve that dilemma? How do you convert enough pragmatists into radicals to win elections in the absence of a perceived emergency? You wrote to achieve that, we need to blend grassroots networks, advocacy groups, funders and political parties into a whole that's far more than the sum of its parts. And you noted that the political right has typically been far better at doing this. And I totally agree with those insights. So what political innovations do you think hold the best prospects for, for rapidly creating this broad coalition? For example, you mentioned in your blog about deep canvassing. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I think the strategic need is to recognize, I mean, I'm, I'm not the first to say this by any means. I'm um, a huge admirer of the work, for example, of George Marshall, one of the founders of Climate Outreach. And George wrote a wonderful book, I think it was back in 2014, called Don't Even Think About It, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Ignore Climate Change. Um, George takes polarization on climate really seriously. And one of the points he always makes is that it's much too big of an issue 
to be solved without pretty much you know all of society on board with the with the solution we're talking about a huge transition here and yet what worries me about some climate activism quite a lot of climate activism is that it acts as if we in inverted commas can win just with a small fired up base of kind of activists who you know are probably on the the leftwards end of the political spectrum um, and actually you know we need to be winning people over from across the political spectrum and very encouragingly uh, opinion polling at least here in the uk does seem to suggest that people across the spectrum are fired up about climate change. They do think it's real. They do think humans are causing it. They do think it's urgent to do something about it. There was some great work that came out earlier this year from More in Common Climate Outreach again and the European Climate Foundation looking at exactly that and finding that across a range of different so-called segments of opinion from left to right all the way along the political spectrum, the potential for a big coalition that leads to a big consensus is there on climate change. So it's not so much a question of converting people from being climate skeptics, they're already pretty much in the right place. It's much more a question of activating them. Because so often we find with climate that you get, you know, what looks like strong support for climate policies in opinion polls, but then it turns out to be quite a thin yes. So you know, when someone from YouGov phones you up and you're in their poll sample, you'll say, Oh, yeah, I think it's a really big deal. Are you prepared to incur you know, serious cost or inconvenience as a result, much more open to question. And in order to do that job of firing people up across the political spectrum, I think we need to start with a form of campaigning that's really based on kind of building bridges, on connecting with people. And, you know, I think that implies a whole range of different tactics. You've already touched on one, which is deep canvassing, which is such a fascinating area. So this is an approach first developed um, actually by LGBTQ activists in the United States. The story of how it began was that there was in California um, a kind of referendum at statewide level on banning equal marriage. And to the absolute amazement and horror of a lot of LGBTQ activists, the, the ballot was passed and equal marriage was kind of banned. This was before obviously national legislation on equal marriage. And understandably, a lot of activists were furious and, you know, wanted to kind of go out and mobilize and protest. But a group of activists led by um, Dave Fleischer at the LA LGBT Center's Leadership Lab had the idea of going to kind of talk to some of their most ardent opponents and just have some conversations and just start by really looking to understand why they had voted the way that they did. And if nothing else, that's going to give you a bunch of useful political intelligence. But in fact, what Dave and his team discovered was that once these conversations were underway, it was possible by asking a whole series of open ended questions um, and really trying to understand the emotions and the experiences that led people to their opinions mm. to find a kind of base, um, a foundation of shared experience of empathy with each other. And then sometimes from that foundation, it was possible to actually invite people to change their minds. You're not defeating them in an argument. You're not pummeling them with facts and figures. You're just kind of <clears throat> establishing where kind of emotional, you know, the emotions um, are kind of universal. Like you feel care for that person. I feel care for this person. And then you're moving people into a mental state where they're much more likely to sort of, you know, look again at their opinions and reconsider them. And it's a really, really interesting approach to campaigning because it tips so much conventional wisdom on its head. I mean, the conventional wisdom of what you do when you're canvassing during an election campaign is what they call get out the vote. You identify the people you think will vote for you and then you make sure they turn out on polling day. The idea of like spending time with your most ardent opponents to understand them and maybe try and win them over really tips that conventional wisdom on its head. But the evidence, and this has been you know, exhaustively uh, researched by academics, the evidence is that it does work. It takes longer to train activists to do it. The conversations take longer than traditional canvassing conversation, but it does work. It changes people's minds a lot of the time. So that's one example. Um, but then I think you know, there's lots of other tactics um, that are relevant here. I mean, one that I often think of is just making sure that activists and movements look representative of the people that they're trying to win over. 
I mean, I was involved in Extinction Rebellion a couple of years back um, and actually ended up after very little time involved in XR as one of the media coordinators for its actions um, that happened in Leeds when they were doing actions all over various cities in the UK simultaneously. And the thing that gave me pause on that bridge that we'd occupied for that week was that we sort of looked exactly like the stereotype. I mean, someone once referred to referred to it as Glastonbury Times Waitrose, <laughs> which is kind of harsh and kind of a caricature, but you know, there is some truth to it. So, you know, very white, very middle class. And I think XR realized um, that it had a problem with racial diversity and started to sort of think much more seriously about that. Um, I think, you know, incidents like the one at Canning Town, where a bunch of XR activists kind of stopped underground trains from moving during rush hour in a very working class area of London, showed that, you know, they, they could still nevertheless be incredibly tin-eared about how they were coming across. It just looked like a bunch of very privileged, you know, rich kids basically getting in the way of working class people who were just trying to get to work first thing in the morning. It was just tone deaf. So I think just making sure that, you know, activism looks representative of the people it's trying to win over, that it's not easy to other as just, you know, people who are different from me also really matters. And there's lots of other sort of things that, that you could add to that list, but that's just a couple of examples. I absolutely agree with that, Alex, but I want to press you more on this question of how you create this representative broad coalition. Getting back to Extinction Rebellion, one of its founders, Gail Bradbrook, recently said, they have money, we have organizing. They meaning the well-funded groups that oppose strong climate action. So on average, it's been estimated that deep canvassing, for example, has something like a 10% success rate. And these are all time consuming one to one conversations. Uh, and environmental activism doesn't have the money to train and deploy tens of thousands of deep canvassers. And neither do we have enough time left to gradually build a voluntary movement of canvassers. So what are the prospects of persuading enough people to um, support more radical action fast enough? I mean, I think that to start with, in terms of how do we get enough people into the movement to make a difference, one of the things we need to do is recognize, I think that, you know, a lot of people are turned off by quotes, activism. Um, so my friend Anthea Lawson wrote a wonderful book recently called The Entangled Activist, which gets into some of this. Um, and it explores that, you know, a lot of just normal people would see activists as quotes, troublemakers, as like really quite different from quotes, people like me. And yet, you know, we need um, people who don't see themselves as activists involved in a movement on this scale in order for it to work. And I think that, you know, XR from the outset placed enormous emphasis on like, let's get as many people as possible arrested. Their kind of theory of change was that, you know, they'd overwhelm prisons with people or jails, police stations with people who'd been arrested. Um, and also they had this idea lifted from an American political scientist called Erica Chenoweth that, you know, when you had 2.5% of a population engaged, that was enough for a tipping point. I think both of those things were really open to question. I mean, just getting as many people arrested as possible was not a well thought theory of change. Um, you know, that was lifted from a very different context. Yeah. Um, and similarly, the Erica Chenoweth stat that they cited so widely, that, that was about a completely different context again. That's how much of a population is needed to overthrow an autocratic government, not to sustain support for an energy transition, which is going to take decades. So I think, you know, thinking about what a, a kind of more inclusive form of climate campaigning might look like, I think it would have a kind of ladder of engagement um, so that people who don't see themselves as activists but do mind about climate change there's opportunities for them to participate. It's not a sort of in-group of kind of insiders manning the barricades and then everybody else, it's a kind of spectrum. So I think that's one thing about just getting more people involved. And then in terms of deep canvassing, I mean, that's just one of a whole range of different tactics that can be used. You're quite right that it is expensive and res resource intensive, as I said earlier. Um, so you clearly want to be focusing that on the areas where it's gonna have most impact. So my friends at the Campaign to Defend Aid and Development in the UK are doing deep canvassing on support for foreign aid. And what they do is really target that in the parliamentary constituencies where it's gonna have most impact, which is smart. I mean, so, you know, for instance, cabinet ministers constituencies. So 
you know, there's, there's ways of using it strategically, but more broadly, you know, we need an enormous public information campaign about climate change. One of the problems we've got is that um, people tend to assume that the problem's being solved because if it wasn't being solved, which it isn't, and it was a huge deal, which it is, then surely the government would be talking about nothing else, which they're not. <laughs> and so that kind of cognitive dissonance leads people to sort of assume that it's not really real. Now, you know, George Marshall, again, to go back to him, has been talking for ages about we need a huge public information push on climate change. Um, you know, I think back to historical examples, like when the uh, United Nations came into being, um, it was recognized that there was potential very strong pushback on that idea in the United States. So there was an enormous kind of mobilization of roadshows and information to explain the idea to people. Um, walk them through, you know, why this was needed, what it would look like, why it would be good for America. Mm. Really, really worked at transforming public opinion. I think another thing that, you know, a kind of movement like this could do would be just to sort of help to do immediate response when you have climate impacts, things like floods, which keep afflicting uh, towns all over Britain. And imagine if activists, rather than doing things like blocking underground trains or blocking junctions of the M25, like Insulate Britain is doing at the moment, were, you know, like the Red Cross, kind of first responders who would very visibly show up um, helping, you know, connecting with people, um, you know, delivering disaster response and humanitarian assistance, while just quietly making the point, um, and increasingly noisy, you know, in the, you know, as the immediate disaster response phase ebbs, that this is about climate change, that there's a reason these disasters, these floods, um, these droughts, whatever it may be, keep happening. Um, I think that, you know, that the, the linking theme to all of these ideas is it's a form of campaigning that's really based on connection and doing everything to avoid a kind of in-group where you have a sort of very tight-knit crew who are often sort of, you know, in their own little echo chamber rather than building those bridges. Um, and that I think is, you know, just a crucial principle of what it's gonna take to, to win this struggle. And then finally, on your point about urgency, of course, you're absolutely right. I mean, the clock is ticking so loudly. And yet, I mean, I think that this is an existential issue and there's no way through it, except by doing the kind of hard inner work that's involved. I mean, we've touched on the psychological aspects of some of this already. And, all of us in different ways are gonna be grappling with eco-anxiety and climate grief as the impacts stack up. And that's going to imply work to be done. But then there's also the kind of relational work of just you know, helping each other through it and coming together to navigate this, trans this transition. And you know, that stuff is going to take time to do. And if there were a clear shortcut, if there were an obvious alternative, I'd be saying, let's do that because I agree with you that you know, we are so out of time at this point. But I don't see what the alternative to that is. We've got to bring people with us. I don't see a sort of you know, eco-authoritarian alternative where a government just sort of says, we're doing this. I mean, that's clearly not gonna happen here in the UK. So we've no choice but to kind of win a critical mass of people over from across the political spectrum. Alex's conclusions ring powerfully true for me. We have no choice but to win over a critical mass of people from across the political spectrum. And this is equally true at the local level, perhaps especially at the local level, where strong personal and community ties can create innovative and resilient solutions that people can immediately see the benefits of, regardless of whatever is happening at the national or international level. Two people at the forefront of thinking about social and political innovations at the local community level are Lucy Stone and Gustavo de Oca. Lucy and De Gustavo are social entrepreneurs, writers and strategists working with community-based organizations and are co-founders of Our Common Climate. They co-authored together with Ian Christie a chapter entitled A Commoner's Climate Movement in the recently published book Addressing the Climate Crisis, Local Action in Theory and Practice. I asked Gustavo and Lucy to explain why it's so important for us to think about innovations that bring people together 
at the community level. I don't think we want to say that what we're, cut, what we're suggesting is the best innovation. Or the only. Or... But I'd say there's a space that we're interested yeah. in exploring, which maybe is the needed innovation at the moment. So. Or, or yeah, or, or, or perhaps I think what the what the what the innovation in what we're talking about is is the opening up of the possibility space. You know, wh whereas I guess one of our assumptions is that there are a couple areas in which the the, the the solutions are framed largely along kind of two axes. You know, uh, on one side it's the state business axes is one of the areas in which we expect solutions to come from. And what we're interested in is actually there's a third axis, which is community. You know, and if you think about the so the points that you can plot on a on a two axis grid are two dimensional, and as soon as you open up a third axis, all of a sudden the points that you can open up in that three dimensional grid multiply. You know, you get far more options and alternatives. I think that's that's interesting in the you know as, as an alternative to just a state business duality, but also in in the difference between the individual and the system. That's another place where the kind of the the solution grid is looking either at the x-axis of individuals or the y-axis of, of kind of system type solutions. But when you come up with something down the middle, which is a, a, a collective, you, again, you're increasing the kind of dimensional space in which problems can be found. Um, so perhaps the, the, the commenting angle we're finding is the types of innovations that allows. It's almost like a, a meta in, uh, innovation, if you like. Yeah. So the innovation is a social, kind of cultural, almost, innovation. So if we, if we agree that the climate crisis is primarily now a, a political, social, cultural challenge, as in we have the technologies, we have the technological solution, so-called solutions, we even have enough finance if we choose to use it, it's really a question of political mobilisation, um, and, and power and the power dynamics that are that are creating a logjam in political progress. But, and but on some level, like some changes are happening already, right? So in a, yeah, in a way, the transition is underway. So the transition is not something now we're trying to gear towards. We are in the midst of it, and it's messy. It's already happening. Both the impacts of climate change we're already seeing over one one degree of of warming. And the, tr the the messy transition that now is no longer going to be, you know, slow and steady and calm and measured and planned over 30 years, although, you know, the net zero target language likes to give that impression. That's not the case anymore. The science is pretty clear now. We need to drastically, radically reduce carbon emissions over the next five to eight year time frame. This is really quick. This is a quick transition that needs to happen. And it's going to be messy and it is not going to be perfect. And so we need to make sure that transition has people at the heart of it. Otherwise, we're just switching out dirty technology for clean technology. And we're just creating the same inequalities and the same injustices. And we're propping up the same power dynamics. And we're probably just laying the groundwork for the next crisis in 50 to 100 years time. So, as Gustavo said, this opportunity space, we think that is the, perhaps the important innovation that's maybe missing at the moment. This opportunity space for looking beyond just thinking about individual action versus systemic or state and corporate action and actually looking at collective citizen action, not just action of citizens as individuals, as consumers or as voters but how citizens collectively come together. And so we've been exploring this idea of, of the commons. And so borrowing from Ostrom, really looking at the commons as a concept of collective, having a collective stake uh, and say and participation in not just the transition, but the assets that are generated in a green economy. So that might look like community ownership of renewable energy. There are lots of different ways to do that, lots of different models for that, whether it's a co-op, um, a community enterprise. But the point is, it's neither exactly state or private sector. It's a different space. And this space is perhaps what's missing. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, to your point about the speed that is needed, 
you know, one of the frequent challenges, you know, or, you know, the reasons to think the state can do it is because it's got big levers, right? Or business can do it because it's got big money. Um, and, and so often the kind of the more collective approach or the citizen led in, as collectives is, is, is seen as kind of slow and, and, and quaint. And, you know, I, I guess here the suggestion is that, um, you know, part of the movement needs to be that people need to start asking for it. You know, we, when, the, when, the, when the solutions are painted as kind of along those two poles, it, it leaves people without agency. And when people have had very little agency, as, as we've kind of got used to little agency, um, they are reluctant to give things up. You know, asking somebody to, to, to change their way of behaving when the only alternative is just not conceiving the thing that they were doing before, they're going to be very reluctant. When the alternative is to provide them with some kind of um, meaningfulness, purposefulness, replace it with um, a role to play and a stake and perhaps some ownership in, in, in the new future. The, the thinking there is that that can accelerate people's uh, desire to see it come. So almost like a pull pressure rather than a, 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 a resistance for it. Yeah. And, and Eleanor Ostrom, who, you know, won the Nobel Prize for economics, first woman to win the Nobel Prize, really should be, really should be more of a household name. And her, you know, what she showed, as Gustav said, that when people are involved in, you know, collective common pool resource decisions, they're more willing to accept the consequences that might otherwise seem as unacceptable sacrifices. And this is really important if we accept that we are in a messy transition, there are going to be winners and losers, and we want to do everything we can to make sure that we are creating a just transition. And it's no longer good enough just to ask people to have a say in the transition. If you give people that stake and that participation, Ostrom show, they're more willing to accept the sort of sacrifices that will be required. And also because obviously there is some benefit, there is a more direct benefit from participating and a more of a sense of control over the process of transition. And we know from psychology that a sense of control is almost as important as the transition impacts in its own right. And the other, the other the other kind of counter argument that I've heard many times by, by climate friends in the space is, you know, when you're confronted by the urgency, the huge, the enormity of the scale of the tons of carbon dioxide that needs to be reduced and uh, extracted from the atmosphere. It's really easy, as Gustavo said, to dismiss kind of community and commons as small and woolly and nice and lovely, but you're not going to get the scale of, of the impact that we need. But we know there is, there's some evidence to show that's, that's, not, that's not entirely true. We know that indigenous, collectively owned, uh, collectively managed forestry projects sequester more carbon than government or private sector, uh, or conservative, sorry, conservation equivalent projects. And similarly with, 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 with wind turbine planning permission, processes, community-based, community-owned, sorry, wind turbine schemes are far better able to, typically, better able to secure planning support because they have that stake from the community. So actually this could be a way to speed up the transition, um, we would argue. You mentioned several times this concept of the commons or commoning, which is the, the subject of your recently published book chapter, A Commonist Climate Movement. Perhaps you could explain what you mean by the commons in the context of climate change. So the commons is typically known, typically associated as co with, uh, with common land. So common land for grazing or woodland use is the sort of most readily recognised um, form of ownership, uh, of commoning, sorry. And, you know, it's an ancient practice of managing shared access. It doesn't necessarily mean need to mean shared ownership, but it's more about the shared access and use and negotiating that between different people. And it doesn't just refer to land. So we would argue in the context of climate change that the concept of commons, a commons, a collectively managed resource and access to resource 
could also apply to renewable energy, could also apply to woodland, um, could also apply to all the, all the green resources that need to be created and managed as we transition away from a fossil fuel economy. And this common practice obviously is, is ancient, it exists in every country in the world in different forms and in different contexts. And it's been eroded, it's been particularly eroded in the UK. Um, but it's been eroded in many countries. And that's a, that's a fight that's happening alongside the climate fight. And by allying those two together, there's, there's, there's gains to be made on a just transition and on equity and on climate change. So just to give a few examples of what we mean by commoning in the context of the climate crisis. So, so we mentioned commoning as not just collective ownership, but collective access and collective um, kind of management of resources, if you like. And just to give a few examples, and this is all underway, so this is all abstract, these exist already. So we've mentioned community owned energy, so there are lots of community owned and community managed um, solar and wind and other projects across, across the UK and, in, and internationally. Um, but also land use, so you know, we know land use needs to be drastically transformed in the coming decades not just to reduce carbon emissions, but to restore peatland, increase tree planting, reduce agriculture impacts, deforestation. Farmers face huge risk and uncertainty to navigate this transition. And the policy environment is, is woefully inadequate. So community managed or community owned farms are another option. They share the risks as well as the, as the benefits with the farmers. Shareholders can even provide labour as well. And then you have community land trusts which come together to, um, to, to, to purchase land on behalf of a community and then create, um, create affordable housing for the community. And interestingly, a lot of community land trusts don't necessarily set out with an explicit climate target, but often community land trust housing ends up being sustainable High, with, with high levels of sustainability in the design because the objectives are to create affordable long-term housing rather than purely short-term profit mo motive. So these are just a few examples of how, of how we're thinking about commoning as a solution, as one of the solutions to the climate crisis. Lucy and Gustavo's passionate conviction in the transformative potential of commoning is such an inspiring and hopeful vision, and even more so as they go on to explain the narrative potential of this community innovation, the story that can be told, that might be one of the key missing links that we need to bring people together into, as Alex put it, that larger us. There's a narrative message here, which is maybe we need to stop just getting bogged down in the, in the tired debate of individual token token actions which are you know frankly a propaganda from the fossil fuel industry to put the guilt on individuals to success systemic change which undoubtedly is what needs to happen but it's very hard to feel empowered when systemic change requires a, f a few actors with extraordinary amounts of power and control and maybe introducing this narrative of collective action not just as a campaign action but as a practical way of envisaging and bringing about a different the, 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 the green economy in our own communities maybe that narrative that sense of hope and possibility is perhaps the most important thing about the commoning agenda it creates that that possibility space of focusing collectively rather than just as an individual I, mean, I guess the other thing about uh, solutions that are made by and close to the people who are living with and affected by them. You know, so, so the classic distant experts of either business or state don't always have the granular sense of how a particular challenge is felt on the ground and how a particular you know solution or technology is deployed and received on the ground either. And by working with this kind of common framework, by giving um, stakeholders a, a share and a say in a 
ownership, perhaps, in, 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 the, clean, in, the, in the new economy. It's a way of making sure that the responses are appropriate and therefore um, lasting and invited, maybe. You know. And if we think about how, you know, part of the underlying narrative problem with climate change is this sense of separation from nature as other and over there, something we need to manage as a resource. And if we accept that, you know, not just dealing with the climate crisis, but the biodiversity crisis more broadly, the environmental crisis more broadly, we need to situate ourselves back within and part of nature. And com that's a language that commoning offers. You know, commoning offers a language that talks about people together negotiating, you know, conflicting requirements and uses of resources and how we live together as a people. The, I like the Gaelic definition of common land, which meant, which actually meant people together as one with the land. So it's this real sense of it's people working together, living together within the land and as part of the land and having to figure out how you're going to work together to 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 live res to live sustainably with the resources that you have with the scarce resources within you know the 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 parameters of of you know 1.5 degrees and the parameters of not exceeding the tipping points and the the boundaries of our planetary boundaries and that concept that language and that way of viewing and talking about climate change I think could be an innovation that might help move us away from this kind of paralysis of feeling like the issue is too big and too intractable and too distant for little me to deal with and feeling like individualistic individual behavior change is too tokenistic it creates that that neutral that third space in between well that's all we've got time for on this podcast my thanks to Alex Evans, Lucy Stone and Gustavo de Oca for sharing their thoughts and ideas about innovations that could really make a difference in our common cause for a healthier, sustainable future. And to Amanda Power and the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities for inspiring and curating this event. Thank you for listening.